Here we are again in Yonkers Voice, and our guest, our honored guest, is Mayor Mike Spano. We're going to have a dynamic conversation about Yonkers, what's coming, his last two years in, in office, and what his plans are. And we're going to be talking about a couple of the things, Mayor. It's good to see you. So, Mayor, it's always nice to see you, and it's always nice that you make yourself available to speak with us. Yonkers Voice has been doing this for the last 15 years. And we build up a relationship with, the, with your office and other politicians, especially because we do not endorse or oppose any candidate. Our job is a very simple one. Inform the people of Yonkers of what's going on and let them make their own opinion about what's going on. Well, you have quite a following now. I know that. Yes, I mean, yes. Your following seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It is, so. Mayor. It is. So. And uh, our work, it's our work. You know, we've been doing this for a while, and our work speaks for itself. We don't need to bash anybody. We let the work speak for itself. Mayor, two years. You had two more years. Mm. You did an awesome job on our city. But I'm sure there is a few things that you have under your sleeve that you want to accomplish before we leave, before you leave. What is yeah, this? Well, th there are a lot of things, but just to name a few. Uh, full game for Yonkers Raceway and, you know, the MGM and that plan to, to see a full an op on casino in operation that uh, could see a convention center and a new hotel. Uh, the... Uh, the, the continuation of the movies and Hollywood on the Hudson, right? Seeing movie studios come to Yonkers. We know that we have uh, one, Lionsgate is here. Um, there are um, two others that, uh, that are in the works that we can't talk about yet. And so there's, uh, there, there is uh, lots of opportunity for Yonkers to kind of carve a niche in that industry and bring thousands of jobs and additional revenue to the city. Um, you know, and then of course, it's, it, you know, the rest of it is just to do the things that we want, that we promised we would do, and that we continue uh, to, to keep Yonkers safe, that we continue to drive up our education uh, graduation rate. We're at a 90% graduation rate, which is uh, it's pretty significant for a big city. We are the only big city that actually, uh, you know, beat out the state's average. And, and we have, a 90% average, and that is more of a suburban number than an urban number, but it's happening right here in Yonkers. Mayor, you know that <clears throat> we are live on Yonkers Voice, and our very first comment on this thread is, I stand with Mayor Mike Spano. That comes from Brandy Nichols. I don't know if you know who she is. Yes. But it's Very somebody, nice. and there is many more that support you 100%, but like with everything else. Not everyone's going to support us. Not everyone is going to like what we do, mm -hmm. okay? Even on our own family, we cannot keep everybody happy <laughs> in that little circle, so much less in a... My circle's a little bigger, though. I got 15 brothers and sisters. I try to keep them happy, but it doesn't... You keep use... them happy? No, no, it does not well, work. I was going to ask you for your <laughs> secret. <laughs> it doesn't work, no. It doesn't work that way. But I love them all, the, I love them all just the same. I know, you are a very tight family. But, Mayor, with all the things that you do, you also have challenges, correct? Not everything happens. You might have the best of intentions, but not everything happens. On your plans, what are the obstacles that you see that you need to solve in order to accomplish your goals, sir? Well, you know, again, you know, with the city of Yonkers, and Yonkers is a wonderfully diverse city, we have, um, I think what we've shown the rest of the world is that, you know, uh, with our diversity comes a lot of strength. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like when people look at Yonkers and go, wow, we've got a wonderfully diverse, wonder, wonderfully diverse city, and they are a city going through a renaissance. There's all these wonderful things happening. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, there's always the politics. Uh, Yonkers uh, has been known for having uh, quite a bit of, you know, politics. It's a, and some, some, some will call it a blood sport. And, uh, and so, you know, we deal with the, the comings and goings of the politics of the day that happen in our city. Uh, I try to make sure we keep it, we keep it level, we keep it positive, uh, we make sure everyone is heard. But at the same time, 
uh, kind of keep it real, you know, let people know that there, um, that there's, um, you know, people have a right to an opinion, and and, uh, and and but at the same time, we should all be kind of moving in one direction. It doesn't mean it's the same direction in the sense of our ideas don't have to be always exactly the same, but I think our intention has to be the same, which is how can we move Yonkers forward in a very positive way. Uh, and that, I think, continues to be uh, an issue for us, is how can we move Yonkers forward in a positive way without tearing each other down, which occasionally happens a little too often in the city. I agree. Not long ago, I think about three weeks ago, I visited Lionsgate. I think you were there a little bit after me, but I'm sure that you were there before I to talk to them. We hear that uh, uh, there is another studio coming to New York. Have you looked into that? Maybe bring it to your uncles? <laughs> um, I'm hearing that there may be more than one coming to New York and maybe um, even come to Yonkers. Well, Mayor, you know that I love <laughs> exclusives. You knew that one was coming sooner or later. Yeah, I Which wish one? I wish I could talk about it, and I don't want to jinx anything, and there's a lot of things that are just in discussion at this point, uh, and, and so I, I'll have to leave it at that. But, uh, but I'm excited because people will tell you that when you get one, you get Lionsgate and you get one, and by the way, that will be the largest studio on the Northeast, right? Right now, we have two, two, two 20,000 square foot stages in operation. There isn't another studio in North, in, 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 on the Eastern Seaboard where you have two 20,000 square foot studios. Uh, so I got that from Robert Homley. So, uh, so we're going to have 11. So it's... 11 and, or 12, sir? We're going to... I, I thought it was 11. You're 12? All right. Well, I, I hope you're right. I thought it was 11. But anyway, we are going to have, uh, but, but when you get a Lionsgate and you, get, you start to get that industry, they like to cluster, they like to cluster together. Um, so when you get one, you usually get two. You get two, you get three, and, and so forth and so on. So let's, uh, let's hope that that model continues to be uh, what to expect. And if that is the case, Yonkers should see you know, a whole new identity. And you think about it, you know, what was Yonkers known for? You know, at the, in the 1900s, you know, they're known for the, having the largest carpet factory in the world, the Alexander Smith Carpet Factory, or the largest elevator company in the world, right? Because they created the, the lock that kept the elevator from, I guess, falling down to the street, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it, but it created the largest elevator company in the world. And so uh, now um, we we have a new identity. It'll be Hollywood on the Hudson and, and you having the film industry here in our city. Having Yonkers Raceway, as we know, has always been an identity part piece of Yonkers. But to have MGM, a world premier entertainment venue uh, that, that is here in our city, making a billion dollar investment. And they are now the largest taxpayer to the city and the largest private employee of people to the city uh, with, with the idea that if New York State passes full gain for Yonkers, that we can see those jobs double and those revenues double. Well, we spoke with Mr. Peter Van Gaal, was very happy with the assistance that uh, the City Hall, Yonkers City Hall, and you, because he mentioned you in person, for making this project happen. And he told us, he told us that his mom was from Yonkers. So there was another motive why he wanted to make, bring his business to Yonkers. Uh -huh. But there is more to come. More to come. There is more. Now, Mayor, I don't know if you, I'm sure, I know the Mayor remembers how Yonkers used to be in the 80s. Right here on Broadway, if, across from McDonald's, all those buildings burnt out, you know, uh, Carroll Avenue. You look around Yonkers today, you see none of that. Yeah, we... Um Listen, we, we obviously have been a city uh, that has gone through crisis. We've gone through um, economic crisis. The city has been uh, bankrupt at least twice. Uh, it's had control boards twice. Uh, the city has had um, a, a number of, of scandals. Uh, when I say scandals, uh, you know, a number of issues dealing with, um, um, you know, some corrupt politicians at the time, um, 
dealing with the desegregation order. I mean, we're the only, this city of Yonkers was the only city in America to this day that had a dual desegregation order where the federal government came in and forced integration, schools and neighborhoods. Um, and, and it was, uh, he has put a tremendous financial burden on the city. Financial one, and it also, the other side of it was, uh, it became a place where people questioned whether or not they would come and make an investment. Because when you come into a community, right, what do you want? You want a stable government and you want a stable school district. The school district was in, was, uh, was in stress. The district, the, the city was in stress. Uh, the, the, the finances were a mess. And, and this was going on through mayors upon mayors. And so um, it, you know, we started to see that all turn around. And, and thank God I'm, I'm on the upside of that, right, where I, I think that we've been helpful in, in helping make that turn around. But it's been, it was really tough for a long time for Yonkers up through the 80s, especially through the 80s, at the height of desegregation order. Uh, Nick was Cisco, show me a hero. You know, I just, you just have to look at the series and you'll know mm -hmm. what was happening in Yonkers. But when they were filming that movie, or when they were filming that series in Yonkers, uh, they had to make Yonkers in the series look like Yonkers back in the 80s. So what did they do? We were getting complaints on the weekends, right? Uh, why is there graffiti on all walls? Um, <laughs> why, are there, why are there uh, abandoned vehicles uh, parked? Uh, uh, you know, just because when they came in with the with the film crew, they put some graffiti up and they put some abandoned cars around and they did some things that that aren't the norm here in Yonkers uh, anymore. I'm not saying we don't have graffiti; we still have uh, more than we should have, but we have a very strict graffiti policy, and when it goes up, it comes down. Uh, we certainly don't allow cars to linger around, and quality of life is very important to us. And uh, and and we, um, and you know, we were always striving to make Yonkers healthier, cleaner, uh, and 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 better for the residents that uh, who live here. Let's tell you something funny. When they were filming, I saw some people painting some graffiti, and as a concerned citizen of Yonkers, I stopped by and asked, "Why are they doing That's this?" Great. Okay, and the guy said, "No, this is the, the, the scenario for the movie, but we will take it out afterwards." Yeah. Well, we had some of our residents um, up in, in Slobom said, "Could they cover that in the weekends?" And we remember, they actually covered the graffiti on the weekends because uh -huh. it offended people. And so we, uh, and um, like I said, it was it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting commentary. It really did because there were many people when there were talking about filming Show Me a Hero and doing the series, um, and they were trying to decide where they should go. They were going to go to Baltimore. And I pushed very, very hard for them to, to do the series here. And there were some of the old guard, some of the people that we all know and love, have been around forever, who said, no, 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 no. We don't want to talk about that. They, they tell them to go to Baltimore. Yeah, yeah. And I said, I disagree with you. I said, I want it here. Because you know why? We should be proud of who we are today. Because what's going to happen is, while this, while this series is going on, the question will be, but what does Yonkers look like today? That's the question that's going to come out of all that. And where is Yonkers today in terms of, you know, uh, desegregation, or segregating, segregation and of their schools and their neighborhoods? And we are in such a great place. Uh, by comparison to those years, that uh, I wanted that story to be to be told. I wanted people to ask that question, and and I and I think it turned out to be yep. net positive for us. Now, Mayor, as I said, we are live, so some people are posing some questions. They don't sure. come in order of what we are talking about, but okay. I have to ask you the questions. This comes from Monica Wizard. What are some of the things that the city of Yonkers will do for the infrastructure? Hurricane Ida has left a lot of residents messed up and still struggling to move forward. The Ludlow area has serious issues with flooding, even with just a heavy rainstorm. Mm -hmm. What are the plans? Yeah, you know, there are, we could, we could have a whole show just on infrastructure needs of the city, especially when it comes to uh, flooding. Remember, Yonkers is a city that's built on two mountain ranges, right? And so, 
uh, seven right, seven hills, seven valleys, seven rivers, seven lakes. You know, we city of sevens. Um, but uh, Hurricane Ida was one of those uh, incidents that no matter what the capacity was, no matter what, if we had the most state-of-the-art system in place, it would not have been able to handle uh, the water that came out of us that day. It poured down on Yonkers uh, in a way that the city's never seen. And there was no, there were no capacity issues. There was nothing that we could put in place, uh, the system that, that we could put in place. Now, that being said, um, we do need to do more in terms of capacity. Yonkers has usually three hot spots, right? Clooney Avenue, uh, we have in Bronxville, Har was it Har Harriman? Harrison? Uh, Harriman, well, I think uh, uh, down at the, at the foot of Tibbetts Brook Park. Okay. Those are those three kind of hot spots uh, where, where you'll, you'll have a lot of flooding. You know, you used to get a lot of flooding over the, at the end of Yonkers Avenue next to Kimball. Uh, but there were a number of changes and modifications that were made to the system that, that has relieved a lot of it. But again, uh, not perfect uh, because a lot of water comes off of Yonkers Raceway. There's 92 acres of paved road, a paved parking lot. And so that when, when it rains, it, it, it pours. Yep. It pours usually down Yonkers Avenue. So the plans are uh, hoping for that infrastructure money to come out of Washington because we need it. Uh, the governor is talking about uh, putting infrastructure, additional infrastructure in for the cities. Uh, it's a deep pocket issue. When I say deep pocket, in other words, the local taxpayers could never afford to replace and put in place the system that we have, that we should have, to help deal with most of the storms that we're going to see in the future. We need uh, deep pocket, in other words, we need trillion dollar investments out of Washington to help us. Uh, deal with these issues. Uh, let me just uh, read a comment of somebody we both know, Angelique Piwinski. Yes, Angelique. A Angelique says, in the silent movie era, Yonkers was dubbed as a Hollywood, Hollywood on the Hudson with seven active movie studios filming. History repeats itself. Angelique always comes up with the finest, finest information. And I didn't know that, Angelique, so thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and run with it. Angelique is a... Oh, you know, Gloria Swanson's house is in Colonial Heights. Okay. Uh, and she was a silent movie star. She, I think oh. she was, um, I don't know, she had a relationship with Joe Kennedy or something. But, um, but yeah, and so, and I know that they have restored her home. And it's still there and, and very much a part of the community. Thank you, Angelique. The mayor did not know this. I did not know this. And I'm sure that the majority, if not everyone watching us, probably did not know this. Mayor, there is a hot topic going on. I actually went to uh, cover a presser yesterday with the uh, candidate to New York State Governor, Rob Astorino, on the ADU, Accessory Dwelling Units. That might be coming to Yonkers. Um, I have some real concerns about it uh, because it, it, it um, you know, listen, I, I support the governor. I know this is part of her, her um, legislation she wants to see, and, and, I, and I holistically I support this governor and what she's doing. I think she's done a fantastic job. Um, but I know that there's a movement at the state, uh, right, to, to supersede some, local, some of the local laws uh, to allow I guess it would be the elimination of one-family zones uh, to uh, even eliminate the parking um, the requirements that go with that. That's a little troublesome because we don't know what that really means. I do. Well, I will, will tell you this: Yonkers has too many cars, uh, and to eliminate uh, the parking requirements uh, is could be catastrophic in, in in certain neighborhoods in the city. And so I. I'm hopeful that uh, what I'm hearing is incorrect, which is that they're thinking about putting uh, this legislation in budget language and passing it in the That's budget. That's exactly what the conversation you know, is. You know, I, I, I'll say one thing. Bail reform. Bail reform was a law that was passed in the New York State budget. And so what happened? No one, they put a bill in that becomes law 
did not include mayors, did not include uh, district attorneys, did not include the courts, did not include war law enforcement. All of us on the front lines who had vested interest in seeing bail reform done, I want a bail reform done, but I want it done right. We weren't given an opportunity to really say a word. Why? Because it was passed in a budget bill. Um, I don't know if it was done in the dark of night, but it was certainly done in the budget bill, so it might as well have been done in the, in the dark of night. Hmm. And so if you do that here, it's the same way of doing business, which is you're going to circumvent local law, one, and also you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to give the people who are on the front lines of this the opportunity to be heard. The, this, uh, like I said, I don't know enough about it to tell you that, um, that, that it's, it's uh, to give you everything I probably should be able to give you. I don't know enough about it, but I do know enough of it to say this is a scary proposition and could really put uh, the quality of life uh, for the residents of our city in every quadrant of the city in peril. Now, Mayor, if this was to pass, the buildings and construction would start basically immediately. Yonkers could go in a New York minute from the third largest city to the second largest city. Mm. Is our inf infrastructure ready to well, handle this? You know, we, listen, we already have we already have thousands of what, what we call like illegal apartments in the city. Now, uh, you know, people who are living in basements, people who are living uh, in, in, uh, in, in, frankly, substandard apartments, right? They're living in apartments that uh, you know, have only one way in and one way out. Living in apartments that uh, maybe don't have the, the, the New York State codes entirely in place. So. Uh, living in basements where we have kids who we educate and pay for, uh, trash that we pick up, uh, police and fire protect, all of this has an impact on the city budget. You know, we have more kids in the school. If we have 10,000 illegal apartments and if we have, you know, 1,000 a, a kids, that's over $10 million, or two, over $20 million just for our schools. Think about that. So uh, there may be something uh, in this that there might be a greater good. I've yet to see what that is yet, but it's certainly something that would require a lot more conversation with local governments because it's going to, the impact is going to fall on us. It's going to fall on right on top of our shoulders, and it's going to fall on, on our schools. It's going to fall on our quality of life, the police, fire, sanitation, and, and taxes. And so, uh, again, not enough said about it, not enough information on it, still um, a lot to talk about in terms of, of this legislation before it gets enacted. Now let's move into something that it's very hot now, you know, nowadays, uh, especially after your interview where you are allegedly made a racial remark towards uh, Congressman uh, Jamal Bowman. NWACP put a press release out calling you a racist. What you think or why do you think they done that? Do, uh, do, does the uh, NWACP has a political motivation to do it? Well, Tell I, us anything I, you I, like yeah. to say. Well, about I, that. I, well I know um, the individual, um, what's her name, Keisha, I think. She's the one who wrote the press release. I know that there's a political motivation there. Um, along with uh, a local uh, a local legislator. But, um, listen, you, you have to be careful about characterizing people, uh, who they are and what they say. You know, um, we we've have criticized the Republican Party for years now, saying, especially under Trump, you know, uh, we are going to, we're going to take you, we're going to characterize you as this, uh, Michelle Obama talked about it, right? When she said, you know, when they go low, you go high. Why did she say that? Why? Because of the politics of personal destruction. And, and we criticized the Republicans, and we should have criticized them for that because there was no debate allowed anymore. It was, you agree with me. If you don't agree with me, you know what? 
I'm going to come after you personally. I'm going to criticize you. I'm going to demonize you. I'll even call you a racist. Even, for, even though there's nothing racist in anything I said. Now, let's talk about what I said, right? Uh, Congressman Bowman was talking about how um, he was, was going to get arrested or rearrested uh, for an issue involving voting rights. And uh, maybe I shouldn't have used the word arrest, he used it. He's the one who chose to get arrested. Okay, so now I know. I shouldn't have used the word arrest, but it was my intent to show the world that I wish he had the same passion for the infrastructure bill. I got schools, you know, where, where kids are, we're at 4,500 kids over capacity. I have schools where kids, when it rains out, it's raining on their head. I have, you know... 70% of our kids live at or below the rate of poverty. You know, we have, we have real solid needs that need to be met. And so my question to the congressman was a political question, which was, hey, show me the same passion that you showed for issue A that you showed with issue B. Um, now, there was, um, I guess that there were um, some... Uh, people who were concerned about, uh, you know, my potential involvement in the race, and so they decided to turn it up, turn that up. I get it. It's political. I get it. Um, but we need to be careful about that. We really do, because, um, you know, my uh, you know, my father brought me up the right way. There ain't no hate in my heart, and you know, it's just the way I was brought up. And it's just the way it is, and. Um, you know, hate is kind of a learned thing. You know, if you really you think about it, follow, follow me with this, right? So hate is kind of learned, right? And so my children, I don't teach them hate, right? But my children know how to Google, and they know to search. And I'm sure my children have me on a search engine. And so when anything pops up with their father's name, who they, I hope, love, like I love my father, right? But, but who they love and adore, uh, who they believe is a certain person, bringing them up a certain way, and they see a statement uh, that they may see from the NAACP or from uh, another group, um, it makes you wonder. It makes you say, well, where does hate start? Yeah. Mayor, I can relate to that. And, I, you know, for the years that I've been doing this, I have seen it over and over and over that very often we do those very same things that we criticize others for doing, okay? And this is a, a Trump textbook. You lie enough that people, hoping that people will start to believe in what you say. It was, it, it really was textbook because it was, um, we're going to say you said this and kind of like, make this, right, what, what you meant, and then we're going to have others who are going to pile on. We'll have others who are going to see exactly the same thing. I even had some of the progressives actually change my quote to, fix their, to fit their narrative. And we were like, wait a second, guys. Where are you going that. with this? You know, I, I, I'm, I have a 25-year record in public service. Um, I think people know um, who I am and what I'm about. Uh, you know, people know that um, when, when Barack Obama said uh, we need uh, cities to jump on and take part in my brother's keeper, and I have a challenge, and I raised my hand, one of the first cities to do it. You know, when, um, when, when, uh, when the horrible incident with George Floyd happened, you know what? I stood out here in the Steps City Hall and helped paint my Black Lives Matter. When the, when, when the demonstrations happened, I marched Black Lives Matter. I and so, I you know, and so uh, I have a record. That's all I have to say. So look at my record, uh, know what I'm about, and, and enjoy your own conclusion. Yeah. You know, Mayor, some people prefer to believe in a lie than believe in the, on the truth. That's just the way it is. Yeah. No, but George Latimer, you know, he also comment on that. Yeah, I was, I was a little surprised about that. You know, George served with my dad. Um, and, and served with me both in the county legislature and in the uh, and, and at the state house. Um, listen, 
it takes a lot of courage to stand up to those who actually uh, say some of the things that were said about me. And, uh, you know, I know George, um, you know, was under a lot of pressure. Now let's move on to what's coming up for Mayor Mike Spano. We're hearing things, and you know, uh, I need that exclusive as well. <laughs> as well. I need you to tell the people of Yonkers, are you running for Congress? Am I running for Congress? Do you have intent? Well, no, you know what? Uh, I've been asked over and over again um, whether I consider a run for Congress. And, uh, and, and I was very clear, I even said this on, the, on that radio show, that um, I, I love being mayor of the city. Um, I, my intention is to fill out my two terms, I'm uh, sorry, my two years left in my term. I want to uh, finish my term. There's a lot I want to get done. And, uh, and it would take a lot for me to consider uh, not running. So, uh, but I was asked, and I've been asked over and over again to consider it, and I've said, yeah, I would look at it, and I would consider it. Uh, that was it. I, so, so if I change my position and say I want to run, you'll hear from me. But up until this point, it hasn't changed. You have not made your mind yet. I have not made a decision that I would run. What about the decision on the fourth term? Uh, oh, definitely made a decision. That's not going to happen. It's not and I know you've heard that before. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, you told me that before, Mayor. I know. You know, but <laughs> Yonkers is ready. I'm going to say something I probably didn't say the last time. Yonkers, um, it's a wonderful city. You know, so many great things happening. And, you know, when, when, when new mayors come, new ideas and new energy, and, 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 um, and there are so many uh, good candidates out there now. Um, I, I didn't feel the same way, uh, you know, two years ago. I feel that there are, uh, you know, many different elected out there in our city who could take the, you know, take the, the reins of mayor over. Uh, we have a, bright, a real bright future, and, uh, and I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to support um, whoever the next candidate is going to be. You know, I've said, I've not said that I will um, endorse any one person in particular. Not yet. But, but I will tell you that. Uh, it won't be me, and, and, but I am looking forward to, uh, to seeing who comes up. To move on. Now, Mayor, bail reform, it's a problem. Mm. Okay? Crime, it's a problem. And I'm not going to say crime in Yonkers is going up. I would say crime is going up in many municipalities. We can see it. Okay? And we can see people that uh, just committed crimes were arrested and two or three days later, they're on the street to recommit and recommit with the violent crimes, yeah. okay? The double murder on the 68 shipment, a murder yeah. that happened on a Chinatown yeah. a few days ago. It's happening, okay? How you see that, sir? It, I, like I said before, um, you know, we've been, I, I've been saying for a while now that, um, that while I supported the concept of bail reform because uh, the system has been unfair to black and, and brown people, uh, especially for cash bail and bail. Uh, so we, we needed to do that. We needed to make some kind of a change. But, we, but um, what kind of change did we need to make? And what New York State did was they, they passed a law that was written up entirely by the, by the trial lawyers, by the defense lawyers. They, they wrote this bill up. So it's kind of like um, the person who benefit the most writes the law. That doesn't make much sense. Uh, with no input by district attorneys, with no input by mayors, with no input by law enforcement, uh, with no input by the judges, and took a lot of judicial discretion away. And some people criticize judicial discretion. I look at it and go, if not the judges, who? Right? If not who? I mean, who else? If, if you can't give it to the judge, because you have to believe in the system and the people's ability to make these choices, right? Uh, as I said, we changed these laws, and we are now, um, uh, I, I think that we have become, as a, as a party, uh, somewhat tone deaf to the changes uh, or to what New Yorkers, the average New Yorker is feeling out there. The average New Yorker is looking at these laws and saying, oh, wait a second, uh, what's going on here? And it's not the average person, it's not white New Yorkers, it's everyone. White, black, brown, 
no matter who you are, you're experiencing this. And, and you know, when you look uh, at, uh, you know, some of what's going on, like I said, just with, with, uh, with, our, with gang violence, we know for a fact that the guns are being passed from the oldest child to the youngest child. And the youngest child, so it's going from the 19 to 21 year old to the 14 year old. And they're, out, and they're the ones shooting the gun. Why are they shooting the gun? Why? Because we pass laws that say that kid will be out no matter what. Next day, he'll be out. He'll be out on the streets. We're taking judicial discretion away so that, um, excuse me, the judges don't really have the kind of like the ability to look back to see, well, what has this person done in their past? Because um, the idea was the judge would be prejudiced against mm -hmm. this person. No. We have to make sure that we protect the residents of our community, the people that live on Elm Street, up the block here, who, who have a tough enough time in their neighborhood because of gun violence and gang activity, need to know that they're not, they shouldn't be held captive in their own homes. So, you know, so while we are doing things to, um, to maybe lighten up uh, the, the restrictions or the laws, against uh, individuals in this, in, this, in this state, we're forgetting that, uh, you know, there's an individual on Elm Street who uh, has to keep her home locked, it has to keep the four, three, four locks on her doors. Why? Because, and, and frankly, can't walk out of her home past, uh, it, when that, as soon as it gets dark. You know, that, that individual that got the, the, the double murder we had, right? I mean, he was, he, he had a felony, a felony, ar, a lar, larson, a larson, arson, sorry, a felony arson. And, and you know what? Under the old laws, the judge would have the ability to keep him away. But, but under the new laws, he got out. And then he traveled to Yonkers and killed two people. Where we have to look at it. And what I'm hearing from some of our leaders is it's a Republican thing. You know, it's a Republican mm -hmm. thing, which, uh, which is uh, uh, insane to me. Absurd. You know why? Because Eric Adams, Byron Brown, myself, and the mayors of, of, of Syracuse and Rochester have all commented, all five of us, all Democrats have said, hey, guys, you need to relook at these laws. All five Democratic mayors. The New York State chairman uh, uh, has, has said, we need to relook at these laws. So... Uh, the public, we're the front lines. We see what's happening. We know what's happening. When there's a shooting, we're the ones who have to go to the site. We're the ones who have to see the families. We're, we're the ones. And so uh, I just hope that um, we don't have to see too much more of this before there's an awakening. Yeah, Mayor, but in the last few days, well, let me go back. We heard that the judges had no discretion that it was removed from a judge, you know, the discretion. But we have seen in the last few cases, two or three cases, that some judges said, hell with the discretion, you're going to stay in. Okay, and so, and so what do we have now? So now we have um, judges making law for the bench. It's not what we want to do. We don't want the judges making law. We want the judges to enforce our laws, interpret our laws the way they were meant to be, by the New York State Legislature. New York's legislative branch, right, creates the laws. And, 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 and it's the judges who are out there to enforce the law and, and to make sure that they're constitutional and legal uh, and that people uh, are punished or, you know, to the full extent of the law. Right now, when you have judges doing that, I, I've seen it. Um, you know, everybody wants to say, hey, you know, cheer. But now we have judges who are... Or, who are or making laws for the bench. I don't think that's healthy. It's not healthy, maybe, but maybe the concern is to keep the people safe. They need to find Completely a way agree. to keep those in there in order to keep you and I, your wife, your kids, and my kids safe from those elements. No, ben, you, you're, you are 100% you're right. The intentions are right. They are as frustrated as uh, any of us are, and, and, but they're, and they're doing that. What I'm saying is... Hey, New York State, listen to your five big city mayors. We're all Democrats. Look at what's happening with the judiciary uh, and come to terms with the fact that we need to relook at these laws.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to conclude sooner or later. Wow. But before we conclude, I have to ask you one more question. This one comes from Carolyn Elizabeth uh, Marie. Why did you veto the affordable housing? Okay. You know, we have an affordable housing ordinance right now. It's, it's 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 percent. Um, it's for, what is it? It's for uh, new, new developers to pay for uh, developments. And when they do a development, they have to put 10 percent in. Um, I wanted to make sure that when we have an affordable housing ordinance, that it's one that is kind of in the sweet spot, right? Because you're asking developers to come to Yonkers, build housing, build affordable housing. It's not something that the taxpayers pay for. It's something that the developers pay for. So we, we want to find a place where they're willing to develop, right? We want them to develop at the same time, uh, you know, build the housing. And so uh, it was always my impression that we sh could move up. And we could, in other words, I agree that we should do more than 10%. And, um, and, and we are now working with the city council on doing more than 10%. But there was a movement within the city council to do 20%. 20% doesn't work. Um, it's been proven it doesn't work. They only tried it in Portland, Oregon. And it failed miserably. And what happened was the, um, the developers came in and said, 20%? Oh, no, no. We, 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 we can't afford to build here because if we build the 20%, there's no, more, there's no more profit margin, right? They're corporations. They're private corporations. If they, don't, if they can't invest their money for profit, then they're not going to invest the their point? money, right? They're going to go somewhere else. So I didn't want Yonkers to be priced out in the market. We've already built uh, over 4,000 units. I mean, we have already built um, you know, 1,900 affordable units uh, because we're not just building units through the affordable housing program, but we're also building units through uh, West Tab and some of the not-for-profits, right, the, the CBOs that we contract with and, and building uh, a lot of other affordable housing. So there's a lot being built. We probably built more than anyone. We will have, uh, I think we have the best affordable housing ordinance in today, currently. Um, but we're going to have one that's even better. And the one that, um, that I'll announce that will be the one I'll have agreement with by the, with the city council, with the Democratic majority in city council, will be one that will probably be the best affordable housing ordinance uh, anywhere. And so... Uh, so, and that's what we're working towards. But it won't be 20%. 20% doesn't work. And like I said, I, I, all I have to say, you know, when, when we talk about it is that 20% times zero is still zero. And um, I don't want to just give people a press release and say, hey, I gave you a 20% ordinance, which is what some people said. Yeah, just say you gave me 20%. No, I want something that works. I want to have an ordinance where we're actually building housing. Because if we're building housing and we're providing good quality housing for people to live, work, and stay in our city, and that's what I want. But I don't want to just give people a press release and say, hey, we did something when it really didn't do anything at all. Mayor, last, last thing, sustainable energy. People can opt in, people can opt out. There is also a conversation about it. People, you know, some are going to opt out, some are going to right. opt in. But if you had to tell the people of Yonkers, stay on it, what would be your argument? Well, as of March 1st, uh, Con Ed's rates are going up. As people have seen their rates go up pretty significantly over the last few months. Um, that's um, probably the best argument that they have today, which is that um, uh, the rates are, are skyrocketing. Everybody knew that this year that you would see energy increases of over 50%. Um, so Yonkers, uh, uh, with the help of the city council, worked with, with a group called West, Sustainable Westchester. Uh, there were 28 other local municipalities that joined the program. And what it works, what it, how it works is this. They basically take the bulk buying, the bulk buying power. So it's like going to Costco, right? You go there and you got 50,000 rate payers. And 50,000 rate payers, and we, we, as a city, we go to Sustainable Westchester, and there is a rate that's negotiated every 
18 months as a new rate negotiated. Uh, Con Ed will, will, is, does not have the same, same type of system, right? We all are kind of given Con Ed. We don't have a choice in Con Ed. And Con Ed will, will raise their rates based on usage, uh, temperature, and supply. Um, we, uh, with Sustainable Westchester, it's based on the price that you can negotiate. And so right now, the price that they negotiated for Sustainable Westchester was about eight cents, eight cents per kilowatt. Con Ed is well over 14 cents. I think going up to their last ask was 17 uh, percent for, um, for, for next year. And so uh, it's much more expensive as of today to uh, stay with Con Ed than it is we go to Sustainable Westchester. Some people have criticized it because, as you know, last year uh, it was a couple dollars a month more expensive to, to go with Sustainable Westchester. And you know what? It was. Uh, it was because it was a different kind of year. The, uh, it was a mild winter, and the, uh, the, the power uh, supply, the price of oil and all that was very, very low. That wasn't the case this year, and everyone knew that. We knew that the prices for energy were going to skyrocket out of control. And so I'm glad that the, the city council had the courage to allow for this to happen. People get a little, you know, I get it. People don't want to have uh, their choice. They feel their choice was taken away from them because they were moved to what, sustainable Westchester. But what they didn't realize, and if they really... Um, looked at it, and that's what we've been explaining to everyone, is that they actually have more choices now than ever before. Because now you can choose to stay with Con Ed through your opting out. You could opt into sustainable. You could go into your own ESCO if you want to. Uh, and, and if you don't want to do your own ESCO, you can go to a regular, what they call Brown Energy, which is actually the cheapest of all the plants. Uh, that is so good for the residents, because they're going to save a lot of money. And what's beautiful about it is and you don't have this with um, what they call escos. It's an opt in, opt out. So if you see the power is cheaper in Con Ed, you can opt into it. If you see the power is cheaper in West Sustainable Westchester, you can opt into that, and you're not locked in. Okay. You know, and, and that's and that's the beauty of the whole thing. You're not locked into it, and that gives people the freedom of choice to have the lowest price energy. And in today's world, the market, that's what you want. Exactly. Better money in my pocket than in your that's pocket. That's it. Mayor, we have to conclude. But uh, the last question is, people think it's your decision and Dr. Quesada's decision to say enough with the masks in the school. Enough. I, I do share their frustration. Is that your decision, Mayor, it's, and it's, Dr. It's, Quesada's? It's, no, it's not our decision. Uh, obviously, that's a decision that will be made by Governor Hochul. Um, but, but I do... Um, share their frustration. I think um, uh, I think it was the right move to um, to go the direction the governor went in. I was I applaud her for that to uh, eliminate the mask. Um, um, you know what? Uh, but we got to go the, the rest of the way, and which is to eliminate them in the schools too. On that note, we conclude our interview, guys. Thank you for watching. I know there would be that you guys have hundreds of other questions, but we cannot address every single question. But the mayor always makes himself available to us. And uh, maybe we do another interview shortly and ask him more questions to give us a state of the city address privately, mayor. So that. thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. Guys, until next time, que la passem muy bien, Malta Portuguesa que passem bem, e até a próxima.